thank you very much for this opportunity to, to show a little bit of my work. Um, um, I'm a PhD student in Brazil. I'm working with the interaction between microorganisms and meteorites. And in the beginning of my PhD, I'm working with Professor Fabio Rodriguez in the Chemosphere Laboratory in the Chemistry Institute at the University of Sao Paulo, together with Elena and my colleagues that were here. And to have an, uh, for people that are not familiar with the, the idea of this interaction between microorganisms and rocks and meteorites, we use in the laboratory some uh, model in the microorganisms. In this case, the, this chemolithotrophic bacterium called Acidetilbacillus furxidans. It's uh, a really model for, for us because, uh, as uh, I was talking before, it's a chemolithotrophic microorganism. It's a, it's, uh, this bacterium is able to uh, use inorganic uh, molecules that we found in rocks to, as an uh, energy source for living. So to do so, this bacterium used uh, is to live in a very acidophil uh, 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 it's a acidophilic bacterium, like to live in places with a very low pHd. So it can use iron and sulfur species as a source of energy and this process of oxidation to get this energy and later to use the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to produce its biomass. And when we're thinking about the, the use of these microorganisms in the context of the space exploration, we need to look for our museums and see in our collections of meteorites to see the, the huge, very uh, different materials we have that comes from space. So we can learn from these meteorites how the composition of these rocks, of these asteroids, these planets, seeing what we have here. And this material uh, represents hundreds of different kinds of asteroids and other bodies from the solar system, like uh, Moon, like Mars. And we have pieces of rock from this place here on Earth. So you can use it to learn how to use them, how to explore the possibilities we have in this material. So when we think about that microorganism that can use material, these inorganic molecules from, from these rocks, we think the possibility of use of this contact for uh, exploration of natural resources and in the form, for example, of bioleaching and the liberation of metals that are important in the colonization and to help the human beings to travel to other uh, planets and survival there and use this kind of, of, a, of way to access this material to help the colonization and even to prepare the soil for plantations and use in different ways to help us to conquer the, 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 the space. But what we know now about meteorites, the meteorites in our collections, I said there is a lot of different compositions, but we can put it in two main groups, the chondrite meteorites and the non-chondrite meteorites. What does this mean? for people who are not familiar with meteorites. The chondrite material comes from the origin of the solar system, the formation process of the solar system. And the non-chondrite tells us about the history of the evolution of the solar system. So we have the first material there, and here we have uh, some differentiation and separation of material. So thinking about the main composition and the main phases of this material, we have this stony or rocky phase that we have in composition mainly uh, silicate minerals from magnesium, iron, etc. And we have the metallic phase that is mainly iron and nickel. And we can find these two phases in different co uh, concentrations on each kind of meteorite. We have this group. We have more composition of the rocky phase. We have a group that I'll talk a little bit more. That's just the metallic phase, just iron, nickel, and other metals. And a mixture of both the stony iron meteorites. So when we start to think about the use of meteorites, we start to think in something that was very recently present in the, the, the science. 
the first idea, the first challenge, a proof of concept was to understand if this bacteria could survive using this iron, not from Earth, but from meteorites, to grow and to gather this, this energy to survive. So this first work from 2005 just did this. They put a meteorite in a very acid media, two fragments, and one was the abiotic experiment, and the other the biotic experiment using exactly the, the same bacteria we were present here. And what we saw was that the, micro, the, the iron in the meteorite was attacked by the acid, so we have the solubilization part of this acid in form of iron two. But when we have the bacteria, it was capable of using this iron, and oxidizing this iron, and got the energy and survived and grow. So, yes, bacteria can use iron from meteorites to survive using iron, but you have a little bit of sulfides here too, but the iron was the main source of energy. But, okay, we can grow bacteria there, but in the other methods, could it make it worse to, to bacteria can be uh, these other methods to uh, be a challenge for something like much bigger like a bio-leaching uh, process in the space. There is one another paper, one another work from 2009 that tried almost the same idea, a little bit more complex, but nothing more to understand, was developed to under, really understand how the meteorite composition could really uh, become a challenge for this bacteria to be used in a much larger process. So the first idea is to think uh, how could this process be thought as a, something uh, much larger in, in a space, in a huge asteroid that could be an iron composition. But we also need to think about how we can uh, uh, make this process really happen and how we can access the information to know that the process is developing well in space. So um, uh, a method that could help us to this process is called the capillary electrophoresis. Is uh, thinking very simple way we have this to uh, uh, the, the material, to, these two um, small, uh, how could I say, this, uh, we, 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 we need this, the, the liquid where we have the, our, our, our sample, and we put a capillary in this and put a very large difference uh, of uh, a charge. So we can make the ions that are in the this ionic species that are in this liquid to go through this capillary and the difference between the, the charges and the, the molecules we have here will make it uh, take different time to cross all the capillary so we can make it separate and we can uh, quantify each of them when they pass in front of the detector. So we can quantify ionic species that uh, we, we are trying to analyze. We can use low sample and reagent volumes. This, all this equipment can be miniaturized, so you can put in a, in a, in a, in a spaceship and send it very uh, cheaper than other, other methods to quantify this. And we can uh, put it together with a great variety of detection systems that can make your data more precise. So thinking about this and thinking to understand how we can make this process work in space, this, uh, this work try to have to, to analyze, to have, we have two goals in this work. The first one is to evaluate the possibility of the growth of the, the, this acetobacillus phyloxidans during a very large process of bioleaching using a meteorite simulant thinking in, the, uh, in all the methods that we could use, have in this meteorite and could influence the, this growth. And try to do this thinking in the space using uh, a method that could be used in space 
using uh, uh, desenvolving a, a novel method inside the capillary electrophoresis. We could analyze the four ionic species that are important for us, iron two and iron three, that will tell us about the growth of the bacteria. Nickel and cobalt, there are the other main, main uh, metals we have in this murex. So to do this, we use acetobacillus for oxidants, a strain called LR, that are isolated from Brazil. In the classic medium for this microorganism with soluble iron in the form of sulfate of iron 2. And we develop uh, what we call a standard meteorite so it's a medium that have a composition similar to the main group of iron meteorites called 3AB, which the composition we have 9% of iron, almost 9% of nickel, and more or less half percent of cobalt. That's the main composition of the, this meteorite. And we have all these species soluble as sulfates. All the growth are in Erlenmeyer flasks, um, 30 degrees Celsius, 100 RPM shaker, and all in triplicate. And the development of the capillary electrophoresis, we use as a background electrolytes, a solution of 10 millimol per liter of hydroxyisobutyric acid and histidine to work all this, the, the species together in a pH of 5. We use two different detectors, uh, one based on the conductivity of the, the material passing the capillary and an UV detector. All the samples were diluted so you can have the, this, the, 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 the right concentration. We used complementary methods, a measurement of spectrophotometry, the classic colorimetric method for iron 2 iron 3 to validate our data and use ICPS OES to analyze nickel and cobalt concentrations. So here are the results. First, we're able to develop this new method of capillary electrophoresis, so we were able to find exactly concentrations for iron, cobalt, nickel, and iron-3 in one just run of the equipment. And we have very low limit of quantification detectation, so we can make it work even for lower concentrations working in space. And looking for the growth curves, we have first the colorimetric methods, the spectrophotometry. We saw a, a traditional growth curve, exponential growth, to consuming all the iron, and later a precipitate of iron-3 that was formed later with the, the bacterial growth. The same pattern was found in the, uh, the simulant of our standard meteorite. So we saw that, yes, we can grow the acidic bacillus for oxidants in meteorites, and that the nickel, the presence of the nickel and the cobalt doesn't change much the specific growth rate, but can change the formation of the minerals as precipitate. We see the same pattern for the capillary electrophoresis that we develop, but this time a little bit more noisy results. We can see for sure where the, uh, the, the, the that, that curve, that the exponential curve, so well, but we have the growth and then the formation of the precipitate in the traditional media. We can see in the conductivity and UV detector with a good correlation coefficient in the uh, when compared to the calorimetric composition. The same we saw for the uh, standard meteorite simulant, and now we have a better correlation coefficient, and we see that the nickel and cobalt doesn't change this growth. So just to conclude, we saw with this work. First, the novel method to capillary uh, electrophoresis allow us to detect in a single run all the, the ions that we, we want to, to quantify, to think in the grow in the space, in an iron meteor, in an asteroid in the space. The bacteria was able to grow in the simulant, showing no significant difference due to the presence of nickel and cobalt. And these the, this two results together make us think more about the possibilities of future study of bioleaching of metal-rich asteroids and maybe what kind of asteroids. So this was uh, published in a paper the last year. If you can see it, if you have any, any doubts about it, you can see it. And just for future work, we propose different kind of meteorites, a more broad study of all of them, 
that has in fact become my PhD research that I'm doing now. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions? Um, is okay. Thank you, it was a very nice talk, but maybe it's a su stupid question because I'm not in the field, but could you go back to your results, like slide 17 maybe? Yeah. Um, could you clarify a bit more what's the difference between iron and iron precipitate? When this microorganism grows, it, it uh, consumes the iron too and oxidizes to a form of iron 3. And even in this low pH, higher, highest concentrations of iron creates uh, a, a possibility of formation of minerals like oxhydrox, uh, oxhydrox of iron and oxhydroxulfate of iron that precipitate as minerals like gerozite and schwarzmanite. So this is the idea about formation of a new soil in an asteroid, is this formation of this precipitate that takes a little bit of the iron and sometimes can take a little bit of uh, the nickel and the cobalt and the other metals in the solution. And the formation of this precipitate, we can also have uh, uh, we can also detect the concentrations if you have the possibility of open this the this, this solubility this this precipitate in hydrochloric acid. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So you have a C C four D system that's excellent. We need to talk a lot about that. <laughs> uh, but off the top of my head, like what is the sensitivity, the limit of detection, and the dynamic range of your C four D sensor? Uh, I guess that the the I can't remember the results right now. But the the range we could work was until. Uh, that's, I, that's I, okay. I, I can. Uh, I, I can't remember, my, but I think that was something like 25 millimoles per liter. We can work with the, the this curve, and the lowest concentrations in the scale of micromoles per liter. Okay. All right. That answers. Thank you. Hi. Um, great talk. Um, I, I really appreciate um, you. Uh, um, opening the possibility of uh, uh, soil generation by this microbe um, on other planetary bodies. Um, in, in that context, I had a question then about um, some of your extrapolations based on um, like maybe how um, this microbe can create um, plant available nutrients for growing plants on other uh, planets. Um, is, is that assumption correct or am I out of out of line or uh, your thoughts? <laughs> in fact, we're trying to see this possibility. We have uh, a student in our lab that are trying to use these minerals that are precipitated to grow some, some, uh, some food, some, uh, I, I guess, was wheat in, the, in these minerals. But we are seeing a lot of problems because they are stable in, lo in lower pH but he, when you get to the neutral pH, there's a lot of sulfur in the, in the, in the area. So the iron becomes another form is our, of iron oxida, oxides. So it's very hard for the seed to, to, to grow. But we are trying to see the possibility of use part of these minerals and part of other materials, maybe uh, other plant, uh, the, the plants that came from the, the previous generation to create some kind of soil to use for future use. But we're starting to play with it. We can see what I can do with this, this precipitate. That's great. Thank you. Uh, great talk. I love the idea of things growing on metals. Uh, do you see any auto oxidation of the iron when, during your growth? The, in this pH, the, the electrode, electrode difference for the oxidation of the iron 2 to iron 3 is much higher. So that's exactly why the, these microorganisms can grow better in a, in a lower pH, so have more energy, the difference, so we can keep the little, just a little bit of, of ox, uh, oxidation, the abiotic oxidation. And we try to 
to take as a baseline when you're trying, we're making our experiments with abiotic two. Okay. No, no. Um, do you see any siderophores for the active import of the iron species? Uh, small molecules that bring the iron in? If I, if Do you see any small molecules secreted by the organism that help import the iron? Uh, uh, my work didn't focus on this, but we're, we're trying to understand more about this as we have other uh, uh, sources of iron. For example, in the study with siderite as a possibility of use in conditions like Mars. So we're trying to under start to understand the possibilities of use of EPS and maybe other serifiles to gather this, the, this, this iron for the bacteria. It's a model bacteria. There's a lot of study being doing about this, but there's a lot of uh, questions open. How the formation of the precipitate, how it works to get this iron. So there's a lot can do with this bacteria. We're trying to learn this a little bit too. Thank you. Okay, thank you.